Passage of time on planet Earth, after the cordyceps infection first began infecting the minds of humans, we would see a progression of the disease from runner to bloater. Assuming this tried and true progression of the disease, we would only see about four stages across specifically the United States, and that's it. However, it would turn out that this was not the only path this infection would take. Seeing as life is nothing more than a reaction to the environment, it shouldn't have been too surprising when we saw another form of infected, known as the Shambler, show up within the depths of Seattle. In today's episode, we will discuss what exactly is the purpose and reasoning for this creature and why it appears to be so much more different in The Last of Us 2 than anything that we saw in The Last of Us 1. We will also discuss why this is not an intermediate stage but a final form for this infected, not including the most finality being the eventual sprawling fungus that we see on the walls. So before getting started, I would like to say that there are definitely going to be spoilers in here. I will try to limit them as much as I can, but just because of the areas and based on situations that you may see, these are pretty much going to relate to the story. So if that's not something you want, I will say this, and there will be people probably mad about it, but I played this game. It wasn't for me. 20 hours, I sunk into this, and I had very little fun, apart from talking about it on Twitch with my Twitch chat, and that's really all I could glean from it. So if you have no intentions of being bored for that long, I would say go ahead and watch the spoilers. You aren't really missing much, in my personal opinion. But if you want to play it for yourself and don't want to risk seeing any spoilers, I say click off this video as just a heads up. You're not gonna, I'm not gonna like divulge the entire story to you, but you're gonna see some stuff and you're like, oh, well, I wish I didn't see that. So if you choose that, I will pray for your lost soul. With that said, let's do a quick summary of how you got here. So how do we first approach this? I would have to say probably a summary of events. This infected first and foremost appears to only be located in Seattle. And by the end of this video, it's likely it would exist in other areas of the planet as well. After Abby plays a game of golf with Joel and gets a Joel in one, which caused Joel for all this to happen, he had to literally abandon everything from the first game, like every single idea to put himself in danger, this ends up setting the events in motion to actually find this creature. The group responsible for the hole in the head at the beginning are known as WLFs or just wolves. They are essentially a group of citizens hailing from Seattle who were responsible for overthrowing the might of Fedra in their area. As infected began to continue to ransack Seattle, neither the wolves nor the rival group known as the Seraphites in the area could actually hold that much territory. As a result, many structures and territories were left completely abandoned to time and the elements as well as the infected in that area. And due to this, it would inspire a creature that shambles within the depths of Seattle. Many structures of Seattle appear to be located underground, which we know is likely due to the high amount of rains that Seattle gets. It's likely not this many underground areas are actually underneath, but not too far-fetched to assume that many would exist. That said, another possible reason for the shamble that it may exist in this different form than, say, the bloater may be due to the moisture levels as previously mentioned. There is some information floating around and the idea that the shambler exists due to all the rain it receives, but I believe there'd be a culmination of events concerning the environment and possibly even detrimental effects on the body that impeded the fungus from receiving proper nutrition. Concerning the rain, we see that in many areas like the parking garages, tunnels, basements, they're all mostly flooded. There are still dry areas, but this is not to say that they will remain dry. We even see that during the events of the game that roads and large sections of land have been washed away due to temperate rainforest conditions, pushing this land into the ocean. So descending down into the completely darkened underbelly of Seattle, we run across this creature moving through the area. It appears to be like a bloater, but getting closer and also reading encounters others had with this creature, we begin to find out that it has an acid attack that could be used to slow down humans, putting lasting, damaging effects on their bodies, leading to their end even hours later as they succumb to this damage. We have also seen, however, that the bloaters exist in complete darkness and in similar areas, so the question is, what makes the Shambler so different? Well first, let's get a look at its physiology, because there are context clues as to why this creature is the way it is, seeing as there are some pretty striking contrasts compared to to that of a bloater. Starting with the feet of the Shambler, we see that it is really just like most other infected. They are still pretty much the same, nothing's really changed with the feet. The skin, however, is much more pinkish in color and also raised and inflamed. This is likely due to the amount of cordyceps that has begun growing underneath, which we will see much more pronounced the higher up the body we go. Moving up to the shins, we begin to see some interesting changes in the skin. The skin in this area appears to be highly swollen. Now, it is not all that strange concerning the infected because they display these traits, such as skin changes, but with the Shambler, it appears to be much more pronounced, almost as if this person was having an allergic reaction, but we will get to that a little later on. Moving further up to the pelvis, we see flanking both sides that there is a hardened fungus protecting the femurs and pelvic area. No clothes remain on the shambler, as possibly post-infection everything was lost either due to time or swelling. The abdomen is where we start to see why this creature may be different from the other standard infected running around. Much like the bloater, the shambler is very obviously a larger adult in terms of stature and also body fat content. Large visceral fat stores still exist on the abdomen, 
which is interesting to say the least, as due to its confinement from presumably the rest of the population and where it was located, you would think it would have run through this fat. Moving further up to the chest, we start to see fungal clustering all around the pectorals, deltoids, and latissimus dorsi. Looking like something straight out of a nightmare from a person with trypophobia, these clusters have the ability to release acidic spores that could take down a person within a few moments. They also have a lot of clustering around the head. The head has the back end exploded out to join these clusters as a fungus likely made its way out of the skull and then bloomed into this. The face of the shambler appears to have been heavily damaged by this fungal growth. Not only does it surround both sides of the face, but the fungus also appears to have either invaded or is protruding from the mouth. This has left the jaw permanently locked in position. Moving down the arms, we see that the infection has continued to warp and twist the skin. On the left arm, the skin seems to be more affected with many swollen sites concerning the forearm. The right arm appears to have less of an infection, however, fungal stalks protrude out of the right bicep area. The hands are just about as regular as the feet, which suggests maybe perhaps body fat content has something to do with the infection. So this person is an absolute mess. The body has been apparently ransacked by the cordyceps, but what makes it so different? What about the shambler has separated it from, say, being a bloater or just some leftover fungus on the ground producing spores? Well, I believe that you cannot point to one particular event and say that's it. Instead, there's likely a multitude of things going on that happen under the right circumstances that lead to the shambler and by association in another episode, the Rat King, which will be discussed. So what are these events? Let's break them down real quick and see why this thing isn't just an intermediate path to a bloater and why we actually have never seen like a ton of these things running around. So the idea proposed for the first explanation is obviously that water and rain in Seattle had everything to do with them. Because of the rainforest status, except it's temperate rather than tropical, this may have had an effect, but it appears unlikely. When we discover the shambler, it appears that they exist both in dry areas as well as wet areas. Now that being said, it's not totally impossible for the dry areas to maybe be sort of like tidal in nature, because we see that this is mostly underground, so it is possible that these areas may have water rise up at some point, exposing the shambler to water, which may have given it its swollen appearance. However, again, this is unlikely, because taking a look at the environments that they are in, we see they are completely sealed off, and likely have been for a very long time. They are also exceedingly dark, promoting fungal growth, and likely have a high humidity as opposed to just standing water. All of these events are extremely conducive for the growth of fungus. So the first condition I would like to make for this new path of infected is that they have been sealed off in a dark place of high humidity. The first point though is not the only defining factor. We see that bloaters all the time are sealed off for years in areas and also may have a high humidity. And not to mention the smaller infected in these same areas as the shamblers do exist. So the second point is that the environment is not the only role but body size as well. This person honestly looks like a bloater. And like a bloater, they were probably more inclined to be a larger person previously. However, unlike a bloater, this person may have had a higher body fat content. Okay, so like we see with the shambler, it is taller and wider than other infected. And like the bloater, this has caused them to be different as a result. But the difference amongst the shambler and the bloater, I believe, comes down to body fat. Whereas the bloater would appear more muscular in some respects, the shambler may have just been an overweight adult, as shown by the stomach. This may have fueled the fungal growth as energy reserves were located all over the body. So the second condition in my mind is size of the body and body fat content. The next one is more based on context clues on the body itself. If we look closely, the skin appears to not be just patchy, which is likely to happen due to fungal growth, which we will see in smaller infected, but it is also swollen. And not just like swollen from body fat, but I mean like there's actually fluid retention. So when I was a kid, it turns out I had like a really bad allergic reaction to something and it got my whole body inflamed due to this allergy. My skin looks somewhat similar to this creature in terms of my face and arms, so believe me, I can spot an allergic reaction. And that's what I believe is going on with the shambler. After infection, the body's immune system is still likely working to some degree, although greatly subdued. Histamines are still pumped out in response to fungus as this body is still undergoing an allergic reaction to what it is allergic to. As a result, it appears that the shambler is undergoing this and the cordyceps is the cause of it. This does not appear to happen with every other infected though. There are obvious skin changes to be seen, but with the shambler, it appears much more of an allergy response. And I would hazard a guess is to say that the bloaters that we have seen do not have this allergy and do not appear to have skin the same way the shamblers do. Other infected also have some allergy response but are not large enough to become shamblers. So the third condition is that the body must have an above normal allergy response to the cordyceps naturally and post-infection they are still just a walking ball of histamines. Getting into the fourth condition this may actually explain why the fifth is even in existence. So concerning the fourth it appears to me that the jaw is forced open and held that way. As we know, the infected do eat the non-infected, and because of this, it's important for the jaw to remain viable to a certain degree. Through all four stages, we see the infected do have 
teeth present, and even with the bloater, though it chooses to use its hands to uh, demandable people, it will likely still use these teeth later to eat as its jaw still works. The Shambler doesn't have this ability, so it had to change and adapt to its surroundings or perish. Due to this need and the fungus wanting to continue to thrive, this inspired change is likely on the hives of this person from the cordyceps reaction located on the shoulders, chest, and head. So the fourth condition is that the jaw must be frozen in place. This would force the creature to change so that it can continue consuming. But could it consume, and what does the acidic spore have to do with anything? Well, we know when we find this thing, if you get a close look at the ground and walls, and as well as the floor of where this creature has been contained, you will see some strange erosion. This erosion is not from water or people walking around, but you know where it may be from? Acid. So let's take a journey and see actually that this is exactly how fungus works. Fungus is an interesting form of life. In fact, it may be the reason for the first great extinction on our planet and the reason why uh, the surface was even colonized to begin with. As fungus moved from the oceans before animals and anchored itself to the rocks, when it attached, it released acid on the rocks to dissolve minerals for the uptake, which will serve as its food source. Over time, this has some pretty intense weathering on rock, and in terms of the mass extinction, this would put chemicals in the water that over time began lowering the available oxygen in the water, which in turn led to a huge decrease in the amount of animals in the ocean. Yet without these pioneers, we may not be on land today. Seeing as it was really nothing but barren land, the acid was crucial to the functioning and survival of this fungus. But the fungus also has another ability. Not only can it produce acid to dissolve rocks, but it also has something like a fungal knife. These will actually go into the rocks and carve channels, releasing acid, and in turn, this can even dissolve compounds such as iron. So this is pretty much perfectly showing what the shambler is. So the fifth condition is acid production, which is clearly going to separate from the bloater and then create an entirely new line. But again, it's due to this adaptive trait. After the jaw was frozen open and there were really no uninfected to snack on, the shambler had to adapt or perish. The cordyceps may not have a brain, but it's still pretty smart, so likely the acid production ramped up to release all around the area of the shambler. This would begin weathering the concrete, walls, floors, everything, and then it would begin taking in nutrients to sustain itself. Over time, the cordyceps may not have even needed to turn to fat as an energy source, and instead would continue to take up nutrients from the rock. So I can hear you saying already, uh, Roanoke, if the acid can break down rock, wouldn't it just melt the body? Well, if it were only the body, say like with a non-infected, you are correct. That's how it takes you out in the game, and we'll kind of get to that momentarily, but as for the actual body of the shambler, we see that the skin is so heavily infested, this may be why an allergic reaction is so bad. The fungal growth protects the body from its own acid produced. After all, if the fungus that breaks down rock were to dissolve itself in the process, that may not be the actual best way to stay alive. We also see that the skin is suffering to a degree and is inflamed all over, meaning that the process still does likely damage the only human areas of the skin, but just below the surface, the fungal barrier stops it from getting any deeper. So I bet you're sitting there wondering, how does a shambler take you out? Well, interestingly, it does see you as food, just as molecular food. Whereas a regular infected chooses to take bites, the shambler chooses to dissolve. The acid it releases is highly potent, and after surrounding you and landing on your skin, it immediately begins to burn away the top layer. Not to mention, if you don't have a mask on, which you probably should, it can get into your lungs, causing scarring immediately, and then likely inducing a swelling response, meaning that you suffocate. But getting on the person, it can begin to dissolve away the top layer, going deep enough to cause the person to go into shock, and if they stay within the cloud long enough, this will cause them to drop, and they will be dissolved over time by the shambler spores. Basically a completely unheroic way to go out. So there is a reason why we do not see shamblers all across the United States, and why new infected have shown up in Seattle. These very specific set of circumstances being the environmental factors, how the jaw is frozen into place, potential immunological responses, as well as a need to survive, all came together to change the infected into a form not seen before. And this means that we will also discuss in the next episode that I covered with The Last of Us Part 2, how the Rat King came into being, now that we kind of have a good idea on why the Shambler exists. But I want to thank you guys for watching. Let me know what you thought about my explanation, or if you have anything to add. If it's logically sound, then I will have to probably add that as I cover the Rat King. Anyhow, if you did enjoy, leaving a like would be great, and if you are new and didn't hate the idea, why not subscribe? I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Twitch, and channel links in the description if that interests anyone, and I would like to thank my patrons real quick. Huge shout out to our three astronauts, Trey Wind and all, It's Not a Spoon, and AVC. Thank you guys for your awesome support. I would also like to thank our scientists, Skilt, and our residents, JJ Frost, Greenlink1999, Vincent Garcia, Nahili, Robert Plattner, James Wiley, and some Red Dude. Thank you guys, and to the rest of my patrons, you are greatly appreciated for helping me keep this channel going, and me being able to afford bills, so thank you as well. Alright, so that's gonna do it for me. Have a good weekend, stay safe, wear your masks, wash your hands, all that good stuff, and I will see y'all in the next one.